order, I recognize the Honorable Prime Minister inviting you to open our debate. Here, here. It is a lie to say that politics is empowering. It is a lie to say that politics is normal. In a world where minorities think correctly that politics is a dirty game of personality and of finding the best way to smear your opponent, we think the power of civil rights activists is to be able to establish basic moral minimums that transcend political divides. And to enter the political system is to destroy the power they have to mobilize mass support that is once effective at getting rights for the vulnerable in society. Let me very, let's be very clear what we stand for. We are happy for there to be symbolic trailblazers like Barack Obama running for political office. The people we are not happy running for political office are individuals with an extensive history of working with civil organizations campaigning on specific issues and whose focus is exclusively on these specific issues. And this debate is obviously one that's relevant only in Western liberal democracies. I have three points of substance. Firstly, one is politicization of issues is harmful. Secondly, when the process of a democratic campaign damages the credibility and trustworthiness of these individuals, which is harmful, no thanks. Thirdly, right on the comparative, we think their capacity to do good things once they are in power is fairly small. Firstly, therefore, politicization. We think that when you become part of a larger political campaign, you lose the capacity to establish basic moral minimums that transcend political boundaries. The reason is twofold. The first is that in the vast majority of democracies around the world, to realistically gain power, you need to be affiliated with a certain political party with a pre-existing structure of funding and legitimacy. And even if you run as an independent candidate, you will be perceived to be on side with the quote-unquote progressive party. It is unlikely, no thank you, for instance, that many civil rights activists will be perceived to be with the Republicans. Why is this problematic? Because you use the capacity for you to make arguments that appeal to both sides of the political spectrum. And a very good example of this is the United Kingdom, where women's reproductive rights, and in particular abortion, no thank you, were guaranteed by a movement that told individuals who were skeptical of government, this is about the government getting out of women's bodies and letting us do what we want because it's about freedom but appeal to the left by saying this is about catering for the vulnerable, for the needy, for whom we need a structure of support. Those two arguments were not mutually contradictory, but they were made by an apolitical organization that transcended dirty party politics. And those arguments are not persuasive if you are affiliated with one side or the other. But secondly, in any election, the other side you're running against has an incentive to weaponize your particular issue and to besmirch it. And this is incredibly problematic. We see in the status quo, the Republican Party is mildly racist in some respects. When you change your incentive for them to know that you just not to appeal to that unspoken racist instinct, but to explicitly argue that your cause is counterproductive or that your cause is one that damages good, hardworking Americans as they immigrants, that becomes far more explicit because you've changed your incentives for them to act in negative ways. But even if you affiliate with a particular side, you still need to be the candidate that your party is going to choose. You might have to run in a primary against people from your own party, for instance. And they now have an incentive to portray you as a fringe candidate, to marginalize you to say you only have opinions on one issue and you are not a person who is trusted to lead because you do not have the capacity to make comprehensive policy in a way that's trustable. Close it. Are you fine with civil uh, rights activists taking appointed positions in political office? No, because exactly the same dirty power politics applies to them as well. Yeah. So, secondly, therefore, having talked about why this politicization of issues means that it's very difficult for them to make issues in a way that appeals to the largest group of people, let's talk about the process of campaigning. And no, this applies even if you have no party affiliations whatsoever. The first thing we need to note about campaigns is that they often force you to take up positions on issues that you actually do not care about. So for instance, in Sweden, the leader of the feminist party got asked, what is your stance on genetically modified crops? She said, I'm not happy with genetically modified crops. The consequence was that she nearly lost power because people thought she was anti-science, right? This is exactly the sort of orthogonality that's present in elections, right? Because you have a couple of options. Either you ask a question about a big issue which you don't actually care much about, and you say, I don't care, I have no view. This is problematic because people want leaders who they see as being able to develop comprehensive policies that are aligned with the rest of the party and the nation. And you cannot afford to just say on the big issues, like the EU for instance, I'm not sure. But if you take up any issue, you automatically alienate half the population for no good reason apart from the fact that you're now seen it in league with them. You then become tainted with all the criticism that applies to the other side of the issue when you are forced to answer. But also, just look at the process of campaigning. It is a lie to say democratic campaigns are about the issues at stake. Look for instance, 
how Mitt Romney's one-off comment about 47%, is not, despite not actually representing his real views, made it impossible for him to win a presidential election. Because the reality of a world in which democratic campaigns are run on the basis of attack ads, are run on the basis of digging up minor details in your personal history, is one in which the real issues you want to talk about get sidelined by smears that are not linked to the issue that come from your personality. I'm happy to concede. All the right activists are going to piss off someone. So everyone's going to have an incentive at some point to do this sort of stuff. I suggest when you go up against party political apparatuses with hundreds of millions of dollars in funding and a well-established habit of undertaking these sorts of vicious personal attacks, the harms are far greater than if you were outside of the political system. Why is this problematic? Because very often, you are campaigning on the behalf of a vulnerable minority, a group which is already alienated from politics. This is a group that often does not turn up to elections in the very first place. And it's not true that when you participate, you are seen as empowering. Because the only reason you can be empowering in a world where politics is seen as dirty is by being seen as particularly noble, as particularly moral, as particularly trustworthy. But that's exactly what democratic campaigns in the modern world are designed at destroying. So you now cause groups are vulnerable, racial minorities, sexual minorities, to lose the totems of, the, of support. And this is important, right? Because to go out and campaign on the streets, to strike, to march, requires you to take personal risk. That requires an incredible link of personal loyalty and faith in the person that you believe to be morally good, to be like you, to be one of us. And that is something that is viciously attacked by the reality of modern democratic politics. That means the real change, which comes from mass support, which means parties on both sides of the spectrum can take up your issue, is never going to happen. What's a comparative, even if you come into power? The first thing is that your power in the legislature, to be very clear, is no greater or smaller than that of any other person in the legislature, right? You are one of 600 individuals, 40 individuals, 1,000 individuals. What is different, however, that if you sweep into office in a wave of moral support, is that the expectations that apply to you are uniquely high. So while your capacity to make change is the same as anyone else, you are uniquely likely to disappoint the group which invested support in you and which put you into power in the first place. That's the relevant comparative here. It also means you lose the purity of your message. When you're forced to compromise on your deep ideals for issues of national security or taxation that you might not care about, but you have to compromise to get your bill passed. The reality is, for the most vulnerable in society, politics is not the way for them, and certainly not the way for civil rights activists. I'm very proud of that. Thank that speaker very much for his remarks, and this House is now very pleased to recognize the Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, it seems fitting in this room with giant blown up images of debaters that prominence is not the same thing as power. The world that we envision from government is this. One, in which the perfect willingness to avow even appointed positions means that they have far fewer senators, far fewer congressmen, far fewer judges, and far fewer technocrats who are within the seat of power. That's why this claim about trailblazers is replete with ambiguity. Either it's the case that we have Obama and then no one else in the history of, uh, of American presidencies, or, under their side, you have people who belong to minorities with no track record in civil rights running for those positions, i.e. Clarence Thomas being the only African American within the seats of government. That seems ridiculous. The lack of smears that these guys claim is a benefit doesn't come out of some PR exercise. It's because people who are on the margins, people who are portrayed as simply yelling rather than trying to get real changes, aren't worth smearing at all because they portray and they represent no significant threat to those seats of powers. Three arguments rebuttal integrated throughout. First, how does this change the tone of the movement? We think there are two, uh, two biggest problems facing political movements are this. First is a nihilistic Special. radicalism that is both self-defeating and self-fulfilling. That is to say, when they avow and they get rid of uh, and, they, uh, and they disavow government and the legal institutions that are the only shot that we have of getting political change and constantly talk about how ineffective they are, they then become ineffective through that rhetoric. 
But second, our biggest problem is that they are seen as being without objective, right? This is either that they are highfalutin Ivy League intellectuals who have no concerns for the lives of real people, or they are an angry, racialized mob with no real direction or occupy Wall Street. Why does our, 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 our suggestion prove an important corrective to this problem? First of all, it focuses all deliberation on the question of policy. That is to say, you're forced to put forward concrete proposal on what matters. That means you need to look further than your immediate circle. So when these guys talk about people talking about like food policies and economic policies that don't have to do with race, we say that's an incredibly important thing. That is to say you don't just want to, as a black candidate, be complaining about police laws because that forces you to ignore the way in which economic policies, the ways in which tax policies, the way in which voting, labor, uh, voting and labor policies also oppress you. If the entire system of government, as they say, is weighted against these minorities, it's important they don't get reduced to a single issue, but rather they see how all facets of government policy are contribute, uh, contribute to their harm. No thanks. The second way in which this is an important corrective is that it reduces the narcissism of small differences and it reduces the infighting within these groups. That is to say that people need to unite behind a single candidate because it doesn't make sense for them to have multiple people running up against each other. We say that infighting is much likely to go down. That means you get coalitions within the group, but moreover with other groups. That is to say, you work with uh, intersectional concerns to build coalitions with women, for instance, if you're, if you're representing a racial minority. The third reason is because you increase the support from the outside. That is to say, you change the tone to emphasize commonality and common citizenship rather than alienating other bases who don't belong to the same race as you or who don't belong to the same sex as you. To respond briefly in direct rebuttal to the idea about like cross-party support and appealing to as many sides as possible, first, this is based on the offensive assumption there aren't two different ways to be black or to have two different visions of what it means to be black. That is to say, a conservative and a liberal could very well have very different suggestions for what it is that is oppressive and what is going to be the best corrective for that. Political parties allow them to do that. But moreover, if these guys, you can apply their material about smearing, about how so much of this stuff is uncontroversial, in those instances, you can still get cross-party support. That's significant. No thanks. I'll take closing in about a minute. Second argument. This signals and, and forces uh, these minority groups to focus on enfranchisement. First, they play an important, uh, uh, important function as role models. So when these guys talk about trailblazers, they implicitly recognize the importance of this. First is within the scope of campaigns themselves. They have totally missed the comparison in this round, right? The point of ideological purity is that pure matter, dense matter, takes up less space. That is to say that it gets less traction. So it's not an instance of you getting the same number of hours or the same number of airwaves. You don't hear from these prominent civil rights activists at all because you don't get a table at the presidential debate which almost every voting citizen tunes into during prime time. You don't get the airwaves, you don't get the coverage that you get under our side. But once they are in, it's important for people to recognize that members of tra traditionally in, uh, disenfranchised people have more to them than just talking about alterity, right? That is to say that they are able to come up with positive policy suggestions that are going to be beneficial to society, that they're able to talk on a range of issues, including, yes, the environment, right? So, it's, it's, uh, so we think that uh, ability to go across and to talk across a bunch of issues is important, not only because it represents their concerns, but it benefits the perception. Closing up. Okay. Were Gandhi and Martin Luther King, who were not politicians, effective at getting change in their countries? I think I think Martin Luther King might have run, for instance. But like, so the, the, the let's let's take an analog, right? So the people who marched with Martin Luther King were people like John Lewis. Those people were very effective congressmen. We think they would have been. Gandhi, like, age is an issue. So, so on government, what does this mean for the stages of power once they take that role? First of all, we're going to say that they bring a perspective that would otherwise be missed. This is the case for technocrats, for judges, for all appointees that these guys are happy to exclude. 
That is to say, the fact that Sonia Sotomayor looked at the uh, the situation and the real situation of Latina people, probably as she herself said in a way that was slightly incriminating that it helped her become a better judge. That is to say, this isn't a perspective that you bring in extraneously for certain issues, but that that person is in the room at all times. Given that the thing that oppresses minority groups isn't single policies, but the range of policies and the way they work together, that presence in the room is incredibly important. But moreover, it allows for the building of coalitions, that you require internal party support and caucusing. Those gifts, uh, give, gifts and takes gives them greater power. Prominence is not the same as power. It's only us that's defending the latter. I thank that speaker very much for his remarks. And this house is very pleased to recognize the deputy prime minister at this time. about embattled political movements. That is movements that represent individuals who have not historically been A, electorally determinative, or B, in power. But movements for whom the overwhelming majority of people have relatively little time and empathy. What we got from the opening opposition was an approach that said, let's target everything. Let's deal with a range of issues. Let's take on a very wide burden. The reality is that the median voter has very little time and effort to unhear African American advocacy on a whole host of different issues. Realistically, they are on both sides of this debate going to pigeonhole that movement. The question then is, is that movement going to be able to produce a unified front? Is it going to be able to cohesively point to an issue and say, this is the issue that matters most to us, this is the image I want you to have in your mind when you go to the polling booth and when you think about our movement? On your side, these people get distracted by the myriad of priorities that politicians have to focus on. On our side, they're able to engender the genuine focused advocacy that leads to real change. Three things in this speech. One, how mass mobilization movements achieve real political change without having their people, though obviously people sympathetic to their aims, in office. Point two, how the political system on all levels has an incentive to oppose these individuals. And finally, how they have an incentive to take them onto issues that frankly are of minimal relevance. So, let's talk first and foremost about the fallacy underpinning the entire opening opposition case. Because they seem to think that it was only individuals who've been involved in civil advocacy organisations who are capable of implementing policy that was helpful for these minorities. We think that is not true on face. We don't understand why membership of a specific organisation means you are the only sort of person who is realistically committed enough, who realistically has the political nous to implement these sorts of policies. They never gave us a characterisation there. It is certainly true that many potent African American politicians hail from the NAACP. It is also true that there are not like a finite set of those individuals. There are many other individuals from different backgrounds and without affiliation to that organisation who can engage in that advocacy. It's just not clear what is so exclusive and inherent about these individuals and their background. So how do these organisations achieve change? Because it's important that this debate takes place within the context of a functional democracy. There are two ways to achieve change in a functional democracy. Ray number one, have one of your guys running the entire country. I think that's quite unlikely. Way number two, create an electoral incentive for all politicians to support causes that you support by changing the minds of individuals on the ground and changing the incentives of political parties. We would suggest that is how most mass mobilization movements work. We would suggest that that is the mechanism of change that we are putting forward. How does this actually happen? What? Through protests, raising issues that people otherwise would not care about or they simply would not think about. Way number two, by collective community action, by building communities of individuals who care about specific in issues and are going to go out there and advocate for those issues. Three, by just collective organisation, by going and leafleting, by going and engaging telephone campaigns, by changing people's minds. Four, by engaging in get out the vote operations. Two things to note here. One, this changes the minds of individuals in the electorate right away, right? It's literally a process of persuasion. But two, it creates incentives for political parties to rely on these organisations for getting out the vote, for engaging in the sorts of collective action that realistically supports their objectives. You do create a cycle of dependency, both through the electoral mechanism and through the collective action mechanism, that actually leads to parties implementing the goals of these movements. How do you diminish that? Because all of this is contingent upon having lots of people supporting you and lots of people willing to go out there and put their labour and their time on the line for your cause. The 
point about minorities who've been systematically oppressed, they tend not to trust the system. That means that when leaders of their movement go up there and are sullied by all the things that she spoke about, they're not going to be very likely to say, you know what, I really trust this person, I'm going to go out there, put my time, put my life on the line, and I have this very little probability of real success, because hey, this person made a whole host of grabbing compromise that I'm really proud of. No. The way you get people out there and to take a risk in a system they don't believe in is to stand up and say, I stand for this principle that you believe in. We are ideologically pure. We are people you can connect with who share your concerns in a genuine way. On your side, you undermine the capacity to overcome that mistrust and to get people out there engaging in the most mass mobilization that realistically engages in change. Now, let's talk about the incentive to oppose. Because we didn't get a very good response to this. The only response we got to political parties will have an incentive to politicize these issues and make them sexual issues as well, they might be on all sides of the divide. Right? First off, not in an individual race. Right? It's not going to be the case we're going to have an NAACP candidate from the Republicans versus an NAACP candidate from the Democrats a large number of times. It's just a point of probability. Right? So realistically, in that race, one party is going to have an incentive to take ownership of that issue, and another party is going to have an incentive either to ignore it or worse, to rubbish it. So realistically, within individual races, this does play out, but it's also just actually not the case that realistically one political party is going to be seen, uh, what both political parties are going to be seen as having equal ownership of these issues prima facie. That takes a lot of time, and it takes changing a lot of minds that we get, and you don't, because you don't secure mass mobilization. So realistically, there is an incentive for political parties to oppose these issues and politicize them. What does this realistically look like? There's always a disincentive to being nasty to the vulnerable. That disincentive is much less when the benefits of being nasty to that group and portraying them as a threat is greater for you. When you are harming a political opponent who is specifically tied with that group and with an advocacy organization that you can portray as a threat to most middle class median voters. That means the Republicans are more likely to implement wedge policies that make it look like black individuals are a threat to them, things like cutting black, cutting welfare for so-called black welfare queens, a la Ron Rayton, when their opponent is black and is tied with the NAACP. That is a nasty rhetoric on these sorts of issues. But it also divides individuals within the party, as she's pointed out, and they gave no response to. Closing. But all these issues seem to be true if your alternative mechanism is to try and get political parties to have an incentive to pull up these messages to mobilization anyway. So it's yeah, 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 yeah. This is a comparative, right? It's about how closely aligned you as a political party are perceived to be with a particular issue. But it's more than that. It's about how closely you as a particular politician are perceived to be aligned with a particular issue. The reason that matters so very much is that politics often takes place on a personal basis. So when an individual is seen as being assigned with a movement and with the issues that movement co-ops, you have a much greater incentive to attack those issues. You're not attacking this nebulous thing called a party, but the actual individual they see on the screen in that public policy debate. Let's talk finally about the range of different issues. Because this is an incredibly important point. Because as president or a senator, you have to think about everything. Defense, health care, all this different stuff. So realistically, you are going to have less time than the people who support you, who see you as the civil rights candidate. You're going to have less time to focus on those issues than those people expect. So there's an expectations gap here. Realistically, you're subject to all the same constraints of other politicians, of systematic racism, of huge disparities in funding, of the need to build coalitions, of all of these different problems. You're also going to be subject to the need to cater to thousands of different issues. And yet people in the movement will expect you to do much more than that. You will always disappoint, you will always lose support, you will always lose the swarm of idealistic people you need to overcome the apathy these people feel towards the system to get real change. Exceptionally proud of those. We thank Tad Speaker for his remarks, and we now recognize very happily the Deputy Leader of the Opposition. I might not be too loud if the headset's being out, that's what I want. Am I here? Okay. Panel, from Opposition, we need to oppose get out the vote campaigns. We needn't oppose people going to individuals' doors and knocking to get that change. If that's the sort of solvency they think they get exclusively on their side, they're sorely mistaken. The question in this debate is where that change is more likely to happen, right? Because Obama didn't beat Mitt Romney because of a stupid video that was recorded. Obama beat Mitt, not Mitt, like Mitt Romney because the, we had the highest proportion of African-American voter turnout that was ever, like, ever recorded in US history. And that's specifically what you get going to get in this speech. What I'm going to tell you is how we change the incentives of the opposition to deal with their one thing that they want to hang their hat on in this debate, that like the opposition be smirching your movement is somehow deleterious in a way that overrides all the other considerations Bo gave you. 
That said, three chats in the speech. One, ideological purity. Second, what happens if you don't win? Third, what happens if you do? Because the notion that comes out of writing that we need to be able to demonstrate that you're going to somehow become the dictator of the United States and that's the only world in which we're getting any sovereignty is absolutely absurd. Ideological purity, two sorts of chats here. The first thing that comes out in the Shisha speech is that your, your issues transcend politics and Michael rightly ignores this because of a terrible argument. Two sorts of reasons why that's the case. The first one is those ends are in and of them themselves political ends, right? That is to say, like, um, reproductive rights in the vast majority of cases require political enforcement. You need the courts to agree with you yeah. to say it's certain it's forms of things are violative, certain um, 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 rights infringements are violative of our constitution. That's always going to be a political consideration. The second thing, and this is really important, and a bit of nuance that comes out of those speech that Michael conveniently chooses to ignore, he tells you that there are politically divergent implications of what your position is. One good example is how it is we achieve equality between the races. Now, you might have a conservative approach, which is to say affirmative action actively denigrates the societal view of those people that you're trying to affirm. You might have a liberal way, uh, like a perception, which says progressive movements and like actively enfranchising people through courtesisms and those sorts of things are how we achieve the end we all agree are important. The question in this debate is whether or not that debate ought to be had through the arenas of political discourse. Uh, as she said no, I mean, as she said no, we told you why, yes, and Michael ignored it. Second sort of chat under ideological purity, and this is the big thing that came out of the previous speech. He says, the purity of your message is incredibly important, right? Two sorts of responses here. We say the important metric in today's debate are consequentialist considerations, and rightly so, they acknowledge this. So the only way this argument is relevant, right? The only way ideological purity is relevant is insofar as it achieves the end of broader societal trust. Why is that not the case, right? Two sorts of responses. One, the pressures exist outside, the pressures these guys want to talk about exist outside of political office. As a campaigner, you need people to give you money to achieve the sorts of ends you want. As a campaigner, you need the media to portray you in an adequate way so that people actually have these sorts of trust. These these sorts of trust. So these kinds of pressures exert the very sorts of things that compromise the purity of your position that are just as likely to reduce your ideological purity on both sides of the so. house. But secondly, and moreover with regards to this trust uh, trust argument, right, people are also put off by inaction, right? So if your view is, if your position is consistently seen as doing nothing and advocating no right policies, that sort of thing is likely um, is likely to put off the very sorts of people you need to, um, 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 to, um, to get on your side if you're going to get the sorts of change you want to talk about in this Debate. Second question, what happens if you don't win? Three sorts of chats here. The first thing is, and this is the new material, how does this affect the opposition? Because what these guys want to say is, what, what this creates is an incentive for the opposition to be smirch you and as a result undermine the ends to which you object. Three sorts of, four sorts of responses here. The first thing is, what this does is it makes your issue a voting issue. Right? The significance of this is now people need to be able to give a response to that question. Right? The significance of this point is consider, for instance, the, um, um, the Republican Party and their position on certain aspects of environmental policy. In a world where you don't have environmentalist movements at, at, at actively at, um, like, um, protesting for these sorts of things in political, in political spheres, the Republican Party would never have to voice anti-science views that we could then in some world oppose. It makes it clear that the hypocrisy, uh, the hypocrisy of their movement become very transparent. The second thing to say is um, um, under, this, right. under, this, under this policy is that you get other candidates from the other side which speak to the same issue, right? So the, the, the example that I used was African American um, individuals, but also some people with environmentalist cons um, concerns might be conservative as well, and it makes the conservative party also change their, um, their, yeah. uh, the, the, the kinds of people they put up for office. The third and final thing to say with regards to this, uh, how, how you change the opposition in our world is that you make it more likely that the people who, are, who share your sentiment are likely to come out to vote. And as a consequence of that, this is the kind of votership that the other parties need to capture, right? So they need to be able to speak to that. We think that that, uh, that problem mm -hmm. is important for your party. Okay, two sorts of other things that were said under this, uh, this speech. Bo told you how to significantly change the tone of the movement. Like, nihilistic radicalism is ineffectual in any world, and it's precisely the sort of thing we oppose. He told you three things that would generate this change, which went unresponded to by the previous speech. Concrete policies, your reduction of internal divisions, and you create a sub into platform so that your movement is no longer seen as a joke. Third thing then, signaling, right? We said two things, Michael had some responses. 
One, you said you create role models. Michael said, um, uh, well, what happens is you pigeonhole, I'm going to take closer, you pigeonhole the individuals and they're seen as speaking exclusively on one issue. We think you might run and potentially win on that single issue, but it's very likely that you're going to have opinions about other things, like whether or not we should go to war in certain circumstances. We think environmentalists are likely to have per particularly pertinent views on this issue. Closing is interested. Yeah. Okay, surely if you're trying to get the kinds of discourse from the opposition parties that you want, they're less likely to want to cater to those issues when they already see that bloc as having made their decision on the basis of their identity. No, no, no. The, the thing is, they might have their own view on what that on what that question is, right? And they'll be able to voice that view in, in terms of political discourse. I don't see how, like, I, I didn't understand the point of information to be totally frank. Michael says, we pitch and hold individuals and that's problematic. We tell you why you might win on a narrow on a narrow platform, but then be forced to consequently speak to a broader variety of things. This is incredibly important because they see that environmentalists aren't only concerned with, like, the sorts of things that we typically associate with people with those green sense. Abilities. Finally, what happens if you win? Three sorts of chats here. Michael says we need to be able to show you that you'll be able to overhaul the system writ large. Historical precedent for moral progress demonstrates that this is irredeemably naive. The only way to get change is progressively, where people begin to see that certain things are valuable and as a result value them accordingly. We get power. Three forms of power. One, Paul told you about coalitions, but secondly, you're likely to get concessions so people can vote with you on certain issues, so that one vote does matter in very many circumstances. The third thing is even if you don't actually get Get power, you get to be put on parliamentary boards, right? Where you have that kind of chat and Senate com um, judicial commissions and that sort of thing. The third and final thing to say here is you increase the likelihood that other candidates who share your sentiments are likely to get re-elected because politicians and political parties have their incentive to um, um, to reach out to those sorts of people. Panel, you win or you lose, it's beneficial on opposition's world. Incredibly proud to oppose. We appreciate the remarks from that speaker, and this House now recognizes the Honorable Member of Government. Honorable Speaker, we think that it is a better world in which groups like the NAACP or groups like women's rights activists endorse candidates that they think subscribe to policy that is important for those groups, and not candidates that simply have that identity and a career built on that identity, insofar as you are therefore able to separate yourselves from questions of what it means to be your particular group. But further than that, what we're going to bring you in extension is, first of all, why we think that it is necessarily worse in the election process as your views on actually that issue that you are perhaps perceived to run on are delegitimized by the fact that politicians are able to say that, of course, you would say that because you are the candidate running on the basis of race. Second, I'm going to talk about why that's worse if you end up getting elected, insofar as we don't think you'll be able to push policy and remove the ability for groups like this to actually uh, give support to the kinds of individuals or get them to swing in the ways that you would need to that would be able to push policy. But first I want to get into a few pieces of reputation. The number one thing that they end up talking about is that they need some kind of coalition, or, they, or sorry, that individuals need ideological support and unity in terms of these particular groups because at the moment they're fractured. A number of things. First of all, I don't understand why that's necessarily a bad thing if individuals have different, uh, if individuals have different uh, perspectives, especially when they tell us that the important part is that there's going to be a coalition between you know, women's rights uh, candidates and also uh, black rights or, or, or racial, racial candidates. I think that's necessarily bad and probably not true. I don't know why they get to assume coalitions, especially if the NAACP doesn't want to work with a women's rights candidate that I don't know talked or that I don't know is benefiting from privilege of being white, right? Like there are different ways that intersectionality ends up coming out that I don't think they can assume the kinds of coalitions that you necessarily want on their side of the house. But then what they say is you're going to necessarily reduce infighting in groups. That argument also assumes that individuals are necessarily overwhelmingly going to be in support of that person. A number of reasons why that's not true. We think that you're going to necessarily have to water down the extent to which you support the individual policies within your particular group. No. We think that it's important that, that uh, individuals who are necessarily going to run on the extreme version of what they want their rights to be or what they want the policy to necessarily be are probably going to uh, are probably going to lose the kinds of votes that they would necessarily need to get into power. So if your incentive is to get into power, I think that you necessarily lose a lot of the legitimacy from
from those individual groups of trying to talk about perhaps different issues. But if you do talk about different, or if you do only talk about the issue that comes from your particular background, I think that you are more likely going to be dismissed as wanting to specifically cater to that group of people, and therefore that issue is not even going to get the airtime that I think is important to those people. Last thing that I want to deal with is the idea of when they talk to us specifically about how they end up impacting how the opposition speaks. Because it's important that they tell you that the important thing in politics is to have a discussion about specifically how you are best able to deliver on these particular groups. I think that you are probably less likely to see candidates want to actually try and appeal to block voters that they say are apparently block voters uh, in terms of different racial groups or different groups uh, based on uh, gender or sexuality when that person uh, is net or that group is necessarily already seen to be identically or identity tied to another individual. They're less likely to want to cater that if they think the votes have already gone away at the point at which that is not clear. We think you get much more discussion and much more election promises from the kinds of campaigns that we think are important. But in extension, I want to talk to you about that election process. Because I think you actually diminish your legitimacy to speak on issues such as race at the point at which you are seen as talking too much about it, or even really not, right? Because at the point at which you make something an issue of race, the rhetoric that the opposition is able to use is, of course that's what you think the problem is. You are playing the race card, or you're playing the gender card. I think that necessarily undermines your ability to do that. On the comparison, you get groups like the NAACP actually being invited to ask questions because their authority lies there and they are actually able to do that, right? The opposition under their side of the house ends up being able to say, well, you can't just cater to one group if you want to represent the people. A very like powerful rhetoric for individuals who are voting in a particular election. At this point, we are able to actually get the legitimacy from that NAACP or from that group, uh, what, whoever they are, to actually have legitimacy to talk about that because that's what they're supposed to do and that's what their mandate is. But secondly, it's important, even if they do get, end up getting into government, I think it's important that they are not likely to be cooperated with on a lot of bills and a lot of policy. Because at the point at which they are seen to be staunchly and staunchly advocating for one particular form of policy or one particular group, I think you are unlikely to get people wanting to cooperate with you to pass bills insofar as they don't think they are able to be swayed or compromised because you would lose the voting of that base. What does that do? It removes the ability for these groups like the NAACP or like uh, gendered groups uh, to actually be able to put support or try and sway the kinds of candidates that are actually going to put policy in there. Because that all that ends up doing for them is saying that that group has internal inconsistencies, which is necessarily bad for all of uh, that. Uh, but this argument seems to go too far. Do you even support trailblazers of a particular race now running for election if your concern is they'll get typecast into just supporting that one group? No, of course, because they have the ability to say, I don't just stand for this one group, right? Whereas the person who's worked for the NAACP for their whole life probably has to answer to the fact that that's what they've done. Like, I think that's probably important. But I think, actually, to be honest, you might not even be asked to speak on bills that are directly, uh, directly responsive to the issues that you've been, uh, or that you've been campaigning on. Insofar as you are less likely to be able to give up those kinds of things, you lose support and influence from those politicians that are able to influence policy because those individuals have never had to answer to or make campaign promises on those specific issues because they weren't seen as relevant to them or they weren't seen as the things that were going to make that particular swing vote because they didn't ever have to campaign for that particular vote or didn't think that it was in their direct interest to campaign for that vote as opposed to something else. I think that it's important that we ought be able to maintain, or that these groups ought be able to maintain ideological opposition when they get it wrong. Why do we get that better on our side of the house? First of all, even if this is a trailblazer, a person from the member of that group, it is completely cap we are completely capable of saying that they do not hold the legitimacy of this group behind them, that the NAACP no longer endorses them regardless of the fact that their experiences are similar. But at the point at which it is a leader within that group that has necessarily stepped up, they have had the legitimacy of that group for years. They speak on behalf of them, and it's important that this is a public forum that gets much more airtime than the forum of that particular individual group at that time. What do we think is uniquely important from second government? We think that at the point at which, if you were running on the basis of your race or on the basis of uh, or of, of any other civil rights um, activism, we think that you are actually less likely to have legitimacy in speaking directly on that topic, insofar as it is uh, expected of you and able to be demonized and brushed aside. But second of all, even if you do end up getting into power, <coughs> presumably through some watering down of policy that's necessarily going to be worse for you and those individuals that support you, you are not going to be cooperated with because you are seen as being staunchly in opposition to something. That necessarily means that you've removed the political capital for the group that you came from to have supported a candidate or made them make concessions and promises in the electoral campaign. And on the basis that you don't actually get these individuals to make the kinds of changes that civil rights activists have been able to push for outside of the political system, we beg to propose.
thank that speaker very much for her remarks. And this House is now pleased to recognize the member of the opposition. Last point of constructive. 
is that by being in the political sphere, you cause politicians who have remained silent on issues to shift their support to your issues that are popularly popular supported. So let's say, hypothetically, let's say the American people generally was happy with racial equality, which I think that generally they are. Then if you are the campaign, if you are the, the candidate who says that this is the thing that you are running on, and people respond positively to that, then other candidates in the race also come out in support of that issue to gain that popularity and that vote. This is an issue that may have been silent and not an issue in the election at all, but now because you brought it up and it is popular and well received, it is something that is central to the election. Your views get adopted and co-opted by other politicians and become the mainstream. No, thank you. I'll take one from the back. Yeah. yeah. American election gets to use his extra time to talk about education or gets bogged down in discussion on immigration. Okay, so now I'm going to go into regulation because there are basically two points on style decision here. One is you will have to sell out, and two is that you will get ripped apart in the media. So let's talk about selling out because we get arguments up and down. So like you'll be pigeonholed or you won't be able to make the arguments that you want. We think your primary goal should be advancing your cause, not gaining power, right? We are fine if you do not become elected and do not become president of the United States, but get to leverage the airtime and leverage the support base to create political change. This is fine for us. So we don't say that you have to water down your views that much. Basically, you're not going to have time to talk about it because you have to talk about 100 million things. Elections aren't 100 issue things. You talk about key planks in your platform. Sure, you might have to talk about other things, but you can still make environmental protection one of the key staples, like Bill Clinton did with the economy, right? Like, you don't have to just pick like, 10,000 issues and have an opinion on each one. You can integrate your campaign as a core, uh, core thing there. So now dealing with the expectation gap that might be talked about, he says, your supporters who have followed you for decades, who recognize that you are an advocate for their cause, if you don't devote all of your airtime in your political campaign to talking about environmental regulation, will throw you to the wayside because you're not extreme enough. This is unrealistic. This is completely unrealistic. You are somebody who has worked for the interests of these people for decades, who is advocating primarily for their interests in the political sphere. I think people might understand that there's a little bit of a give and take in politics, right? I don't think that this is a really dramatic harm that will happen at all. Okay. Now, let's deal with this uh, being attacked and torn apart. Okay, they say that you'll have to sell out uh, because you're going to have to go to the Republican Party and they might not take you. It might be perfectly reasonable for a party to co-opt somebody with a very strong and positive civil like profile, right? Because I'm somebody who has been like a leader in my community for decades, and maybe the the, the, the the Democrats might want to pick me as their candidate. That's completely reasonable to say. So you might have finances of your own. I think that it's not it's not reasonable to say that you'll have to co-opt and you could run as an independent. You'll definitely be out there and saying your views. And on the attack as we don't think that the views that are advocated by leaders in civil society are ones that are generally reviled by the population. We think that we need to have this discussion sometime, right? Their argument is that if we ever talk about race, if someone ever opposes you on race, then they'll besource their ideas. We shouldn't shy away from discussion, and we think that being in the political sphere is the best way to bring these issues into the fold. We are very proud to have yeah. We thank that speaker very much for his remarks. And we welcome now the final speaker representing the government bench, the government whip. Aislinn and I think that politics is the long game, that progress is measured incrementally, and that is when it is most likely to actually occur step by step and subtly with people who advocate for a group that they have consistently participated in and can play in between the lines that politicians are not allowed to cross because of their prominence and their position. I want to deal with reputation to Joe's case, and then I want to talk to you about politics, about leadership, and about effective change. Okay. The first thing you get out of Joe is that when someone from your group enters the political arena, this activates your base and they suddenly show up to elections. Two problems with this. One, they come out for the party you are affiliated with, making your issues singular to that party, right? Like, this is the reason that other parties don't have to activate for change on that issue. Because if the women's vote is going to go to a liberal party, then the conservative party can say, we're never going to get that base, don't worry about fully developing policy, just have something to say. I think that that's wildly ineffective, and it's limiting. I'm going to get into that in my own opinion. But the second problem with this is this is exactly the kind of essentializing logic that makes them a single issue candidate, right? Like, if you are seen to be able to activate the African American vote in the states, that is what they come to you for, for access to only that issue. That's what makes you the kind of ineffective single issue candidate that Aislinn and I decry on our side of the house. 
Then Joe tells you, look, co-optation of a decent message is decent because the message is decent. No, it's a stamp that says we've made progress on this issue by adding it to the agenda. That doesn't mean there's any change coming, but you can say that change is going to occur because you've added it to your plate. I think that's incredibly perverse. Thirdly and lastly from Joe's case, your views will go out to people who wouldn't have listened before. Two responses. One, as a politician, you have to play by rules that you didn't have to before, right? So like the reason that African American activists in the states have to act in a certain way, have to have cultivated a certain image, is because they are in politics. They cannot be the Malcolm X on the sidelines saying this is what we want and we don't care what the stakes are, we demand what should be given to us. They can't do that for a number of reasons. One, because they don't get to control the dialogue anymore, right? The questions are being logged at you. You are not in control of what you are being asked. This is exactly why when I asked the POI about candidates in elections, the answer to that is that almost certainly a Hispanic candidate in California gets bogged down in immigration reform and doesn't get to spend their extra time on telling you that people of that demographic minority are the kinds of people that have multiple views and issues. But like, secondly, recognize that at the very least, Joe doesn't tell you why this group that wasn't listening to you before now is an incentive because you're up for office to suddenly listen to you, right? Like, I think that's ridiculous. Sure. The NAACP was at its most prominent after the appointment of Thurgood Marshall and the election of Barack Obama. What's the point of ideological purity if it isn't her? Great, okay. So my first thing then to answer this is politics. Functionally speaking, the reason that civil society activists are effective is because they appear to be kingmakers. Whether or not they are actually able to move that vote is equally important, but comes after the perception of them being able to do that. Why is this uh, an important thing? A range of political options for your core demographic and not confining them to the single issue voting that ASA talks about in her extension is less possible in the world that OP presents you. Why? Because since not all people of a single minority group want the same policy solutions, when you subscribe to the political rules and you aren't the candidate asking questions on behalf of a group of people, rather you're the representation or the reification of the ideas they think are important, you are not able to serve them up multiple options or even to advocate that multiple options ought to be given. Like This is the reason why the NAACP is the best thing for progress and not uh, entirely the election of candidates in regions where African Americans are most prominent. Because the NAACP can ask questions of candidates on either side and demand that all of them are responsible to that demographic. As opposed to just saying, I will be responsible to that demographic, don't worry, blame's on me if it doesn't work out. Right? Like, this becomes a cover for political parties that are otherwise ineffective at providing those solutions. But recognize, furthermore, that when you are a civil society activist, you and politicians alike save face. When you stay outside politics, because if, uh, and this is all because of the like earlier analysis on like why when you don't have to cater to a group that's already been catered to by someone else, right? Second thing that Aileen talks to you about, and this is responsive to the most of the material we get out of Bob, is about leadership, right? So when OO tells you that people need to unite behind a single leader, it comes into direct contrast with Aislinn's material on being a single issue candidate. It becomes very difficult to claim you are an authority figure if you can't definitively speak for that identity. And if you do definitively speak for that identity, you do that community a disservice by creating them in a single image that is like incredibly difficult to cater for. Sure, be So Lex, you do have to explain now, a lot of your arguments do seem as if you have a problem with a Hispanic candidate running period if it's going to essentialize all people in the group. What exactly is the distinction between someone of a race running? It seems to have all the risks of digital limited talking. Right, so this is about whether you get to answer or ask questions. When you are a candidate, they ask you what your policy is on a particular item. You get to respond, and they say, that's the response of X group. When you are a civil society activist, you ask, what are your policies for the group I am representing? Right? Like It's about which side of that question you are on. It's about whether you are responsible to answer and produce results, or whether you get to direct which results are even on the table. Aislinn and I would prefer the world where you get to tell the politicians what their priorities ought to be and how to begin to work on those issues, rather Rather than just lobbying up half-assed solutions, right? This is even worse politically because you likely represent a group that's been essentialized already. For you to contribute to that is incredibly perverse. I think it's probably alienating to your base as well. Finally, though, affecting change. When you are seen to risk losing support if you've been a successful candidate, politics starts to get really dangerous for you because endorsement can be revoked. And here's the analysis that Aislinn gives you, right? She says it's a lot harder to make the claim that the uh, women's candidate no longer serves women's interests or has changed her agenda when she has a history of working with women in the field of activism. It becomes
becomes a representation of infighting that the public finds it incredibly hard to galvanize behind. It takes away from the issues those candidates may want to talk about. But secondly, if you don't get elected, then your time is better served directing that discussion, right? If and I don't support a world where you get up, are unsuccessful in your campaign, and have ceded control over the direction that discussion is going in. I think that that is a world in which no longer are you the guide because you've been discredited as a representative of that group, but you are also no longer the access point to that group because you aren't successful at what you claim to be endeavoring to do. In a world where you are a civil society activist who has already reached prominence, you ought to increasingly agitate and keep your prominence high on the agenda of people who are making political change. It is only in that way that you get to direct what kind of change they see as being necessary. We're very proud to propose. Thank you. <laughs> we are very thankful that she was not sitting in the chair when that happened. <laughs> uh, and we appreciate her remarks. We now recognize the final speaker of the debate, the opposition whip. Thank you, Honorable Speaker. I want to talk about two things in summarizing this debate. First, the effect this policy has on campaign dynamics. Second, the effect it has on mobilization. Beginning with the first. The claim we get from the opening government is, once you are affiliated with a particular party, you are unable to speak with people on the other side of the divide because you are immediately seen as being part of that particular Republican or Democratic party. Your views are less persuasive. First, Joe tells you, you have leverage coming into this particular situation. You are a prominent civil rights advocate. For all the reasons they tell you that you can mobilize people to get out the vote and meaningfully change the incentives of political parties, you are not just any ordinary candidate coming to this particular situation. You have a unique ability to stake out your position within that party and make claims that are powerful for your group. But second, on the comparative, how are they going to reach those people on the other side of the divide? We give you mechanisms, especially through things like the media, that has an inherent interest in covering adversarial processes like politics by, that ensure that people are forced to see your kinds of views regardless of whether or not they support you particularly. Because you're, they're going to engage with their views in the context of a debate. They're going to engage with their views in the context of interviews. Those kind of engagements never happen if you remain just an activist for the people proposition is most concerned about, especially people on the margins. No, thank you. The second concern they have is, you will be the victim of attack ads, and other issues and other stances you take, like your stances on GMOs, might distract from your particular issue. We have two responses to this. First, often, it's not that easy to denigrate the kind of views that these kind of civil rights activists are putting out. Joe gives you a number of reasons to believe that the flip side of trying to continually say that someone's advocacy of race is misguided, that someone's advocacy of sex or sexuality is misguided, is a politician has an internal limit on how much they can do that. Because if they go too far, they risk themselves being called a racist, a sexist, or a bigot, and that hurts their own political chances as well. I simply think the degree to which they think these kinds of civil rights positions can be rubbished in the media and be rubbished in the political sphere effectively, not that I'm not contending it happens, we're contending how effectively it can be done, especially in an age where it's easily able to call people out for that, I think that's largely exaggerated. But second, I think the government bench is being slightly disingenuous when they talk about the risks of these views being denigrated in the media. Presumably, they want these views to come out too. Presumably, they want someone in politics to be talking about the problems that these minority groups are facing. They want political parties to take this on. Their own mechanism is, we want political parties to have incentives to have candidates saying these things. You should just be mobilizing them. So the problem then becomes, all of their harms that exist of these views getting rubbish in the political sphere are going to happen anyway. None of our benefits of mobilization are likely to happen in what Joe talks to you about when those views are being put forward by people not of your group and not you. That's something I think is extremely important. Yeah. What is the unique benefit of people from these organizations specifically running for office, given that there are a whole host of harms that accrue specifically to those organizations with which candidates are affiliated on our side of the house? Why can an ally not do all the things you want to talk about in the same policies and get the same support? Yeah, that is my second theme. Unique benefits. Quite important for this round. We hear an on mobilization. I think this is the crux of the, the proposition case. There are alternatives. 
We would rather that you, as a civil rights advocate, exert massive amounts of pressure on your group, mobilize the vote, get them out, and force mainstream parties to take on these views themselves. Note that I think that already carries a lot of the harms they talk about, but there's three reasons Joe gives you an extension to believe that that is not as good an alternative as the one we are proposing. First, the nature of your particular base. It is often massively disillusioned from the idea of politics. But what is important to recognize is why they're disillusioned from politics. It is a trust issue. Even if you tell them in this mobilization campaign that they need to go out and vote between two white candidates, or two men, or two people who are straight, the likelihood of that being as effective when the root of the disillusionment of these groups is often a lack of trust in the political system and a lack of trust in the people you are suddenly telling them to vote for, that means you have splintered your own base's likelihood to actually be politically mobile. It's one thing to come out for rallies. You can get large people probably to come out for rallies. But when you tell them to put the trust in the hands of people who have systematically discriminated against them for years, that is far less likely to be effective than if you yourself take it upon yourself to be someone who you know they trust and are able to do it. And on the flip side, you change the nature of your own advocacy. You change the message you send to your own base, that your kind of advocacy can be a political one, that they ought to be politically active citizens. That increases the chances that that group is not only active for your election, but is more likely to keep politicians to account further on. That's one of the biggest issues with, with underrepresentation is not just that black candidates don't get elected or female candidates don't get elected, but that white male candidates are held to account because those groups don't go out to vote. That's what's particularly important in this debate. No, thank you. Second, on leverage. Both sides want endorsements, but we think our endorsement is far more effective because at the point where you are endorsing them now, you have a proven politically mobile voter base as opposed to just generically resembling lots of people who like your Facebook page or come out to rallies. That's a far more effective track record that is able to sway candidates when you have a proven track record of people voting for you. That's incredibly effective. But third, you create shifts within the campaign. I think that's especially important. The issues we're concerned about are silent issues, where there's a mutual pact between politicians not to talk about them, because it's not in the interest of many white candidates to be the white candidate talking about race. They want the NAACP on closing up to ask questions of all candidates, while giving you no reason to believe that they get meaningful, consistent answers, when it's not in the interest of either candidate to consistently speak to those issues. And also when the voter base the NAACP is trying to mobilize isn't a consistent one, isn't a reliable one in the absence of this kind of candidate running. No, thank you. I think the silent issues are where you get to change the rhetoric. When you are in the campaign and asking those questions in debates and forcing other politicians to shift their opinions, that's how you get meaningful change. We then hear from close in government, you're not part of that group. You can't possibly represent all the views they talk about. We, want, we, we don't want everyone to think that, oh, the Republicans just have all the, the Democrats have all the African American votes, we can't do anything. First, no evidence on why a splintered minority vote is better for minorities. Why would they prefer that these minority groups split along a number of other issue lines? It makes advocacy for their kinds of viewpoints far less likely. Second, why do you trust candidates who are not of that group to actually consistently talk about these issues? Simply asking them questions doesn't guarantee in any meaningful way when the voter base you're relying on isn't a politically mobile one, isn't one that is consistently trusted to come out in elections, it's not clear how that actually changes on their side of the house. At the end of this debate, this question is about the process of going through the election and how you change the attitudes and minds of a voter base that is not a traditionally political one, even if they come out to social events and social rallies. Having someone they trust, someone they believe in, is far more likely to get them engaged than telling them and assuring them that they need to vote for the same candidates and the same system that has oppressed them for decades on end. We beg to oppose.